the Italian varietals here and showcasing how they can do in the Napa Valley. Uh, the Benishes, their, their picture right here, uh, they founded the winery before they had ever even visited Napa Valley. They'd spent a lot of time in Italy, touring around the countryside, wine tasting, enjoying the hospitality, the food, and they always talk to their friends about how much they love Italy. Some of their friends, you know, you guys talk about Italy all the time, all the awesome things that you say you love about it, it's true of Napa Valley. So you guys need to just get out to Napa. And so in the mid 80s, they finally did. And they were like, you were totally right. We love it out here. And then began their hunt for um, a little winery to call their own. So they bought this place in 1994. They named it Benessere. Benessere is an Italian word, it means to be well. Um, kind of loosely translates to the good life, living the good life. Um, so it kind of has this kind of cognitive match with their name, Benish. So they loved it for that reason. And they are from Chicago, Illinois. So you can imagine <laughs> suffering through a long Midwestern winter and then coming out here and spending time on this property and find out that you really are living the good life. So we'll um, head out, we'll walk through some of the vineyards, take a look at the, the property, and then we'll try some more wine, and then we'll finish up uh, um, in the cellar here and cool off a little bit. All the different sides of the valley, all the kind of little paths, little nooks and crannies that we have here. Um, so you see kind of the western slopes, a little cooler, less exposed. You got these nice lush green pine trees. And then the uh, eastern slope, it's um, kind of charred, a little brown. It gives full exposure, full afternoon sun. And then you have us kind of nestled right on the valley floor here, the nice little flats. This right here was kind of the main thing that they were looking for when they were looking for their new property. They wanted a big farmhouse with a nice wraparound patio to it. And then they wanted someplace on the valley floor. So that if you're up in your little widow's walk over there, you can uh, look out over the whole mountain. It's 40 acres total. It's a How's that drive up to Hans Faden in that bus? Very quick, the way uh, Sherman drives. <laughs> <laughs> and even faster coming out, going downhill. I'm just going to go for the You know, once you get used to driving that road, people uh, people take it pretty quick. Yep. Um, if it's your first time driving on one of those roads up into the hill, you'll find that people are... Where do we down? Just in... Anywhere. Here? Okay. Oh, just anywhere. Okay. If you couldn't put it on the plants, would we let you drink it? Okay. <laughs> all right. They're crazy. I haven't done plunge all day. Yeah. It is crazy. People. <laughs> it is. It is a long day. That's for sure. That's why they call it Napa, so you can have a nap. Yeah. <laughs> when was your nap? Yeah. That is good. Your it's nap coming. coming. It's up? coming. Yeah. Sometimes those naps turn into <laughs> just the rest of the evening. <laughs> we'll let you know. So that's the reason, I mean, a lot of times uh, dinner is at 8, 8.30 in Napa Valley. Everyone's uh, taking their naps. Oh, what happened to your glass? I'm driving back home so much. Oh, okay. <laughs> this ain't bad, huh? Didn't you try it yet? Try it. Tell us. So How's the mouth feel? Huh? How's yeah. the mouth feel? Perfect. Perfect. Some of the vines down there, they're really starting to progress, and it's always so nice to kind of see how the vines are doing, how the fruit is coming along. This is what happens when you plant rosemary in Northern California. <laughs> yeah. Keeps going. She mm. says, uh, hey, I know that you put me in this little pot, but I can't be contained. I'm taking over. Some Spanish loved roses. Uh, 
Colorado. So many purple flowers in California. Everywhere I've looked, this whole trip. Got lavender. started in this movie called Yes, Giorgio, which was voted the worst movie of 1982. Um, they built this tennis court for the movie. Movie tank. It was awful. They didn't do anything else. It was in one scene. And then they left. And it even looks like they tried to make it look like it was Southern California putting those big palms up. But uh, that's uh, Hollywood economics for you. Build a tennis court in the middle of Napa Valley in the middle of Prime Vineyard Land and then put all your tools in your shed and just uh, head home. Uh, although 1982 Vineyard Land was a little cheaper back then, but this is still a good quarter of an acre of mm -hmm. uh, Napa Valley Vineyard Land. And now the grandkids can play tennis when they're here. I suppose they could. I'm not sure how much they do, but they're, that <laughs> option is certainly still like, open to them. You know, what the, you know what the point of a fence is in a tennis court? It's to keep the ball in, but it would block the view of the camera, <laughs> so they made it low on yeah. this side. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is more for, like, your, your experts, <laughs> right? Because, yeah, if I'm playing, I need this all the way around. I need a cave. Yeah, I need, <laughs> I need, I need the top. Because I'm going to slice at it. And it's gonna go flying. So you guys are had our Rosato Sangiovese. This is the Sangiovese. So this is what it looks like after a couple of weeks on the skin, right? So here's some Zinfandel vines. They're chugging along pretty nicely here. And yeah, especially right here, a couple of big fat clusters. Oh yeah, those guys are looking good. We did have some uh, the kind of more lighter, milder rains when we ha were having um, flowering on the vines. So every now and then you'll see a cluster or two that kind of is uneven, isn't quite evenly ripe. But you'll notice that most of it is, is definitely um, kind of these bigger, healthy clusters with nice, even fruit set to them. Just so wonderful of a little replant although this is this a graft no that looks like that's a replant so for whatever reason some vine died right there I got you. and so we just replanted it to kind of keep the row consistent so you don't have a big gap right there and then you can kind of also tell that this is pretty fresh it's got quite a little green to it kind of down at the bottom whereas over time they get really woody like that. And, and how long do they last? I mean, it depends. Mm -hmm. They're 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 more or less like immortal. They just they just keep going. Uh, typically around the 30, 40 year mark, um, people will start to replant their vineyards because your yields go down kind of around that time. So if you're, you know, it's there's always this kind of sweet spot that you, you want the best fruit that you can, um, but you want as much of it as you can. The really good fruit doesn't start to set in until after around five years, and then your yields keep going up, and then around 30 years they'll start to drop off a bit. And so um, even though they would keep lasting, oftentimes that's when you kind of refresh certain blocks of your vineyard. Okay. Zinfandel is a little different. Uh, Zinfandel will, will still give you pretty good yields pretty late. Um, and it's also a vine they just people just keep around a lot longer. So I feel like these guys at around uh, 22 years or so are, are, are pretty young, all things considered. Um, it's definitely not unheard of to run into 75 year old Zinfandel vines, 100 year old Zinfandel vines. Some places have 150 plus 
year old Zinfandel vines. And you'll, you'll know, well, for one, they'll look very different from these for a couple of reasons. I mean, this is, this is a little guy. It's a little, little skinny little trunk. And it's like 22 years old. You talk about the 100 year old guys and they have these big fat trunks. This is also kind of, this is a little more modern trellising system. So, so your double cordon where you have the two forks out and then just the vertical shoot position. It's more or less fairly modern. 150 years ago, they just did what was called head training. So you basically just brought it up to this point and that's where all your new growth would come and you just kind of uh, train it from there. So it's not really on anything other than itself. And so not only do they not look like this, um, but they're just untrellis. They're just kind of in the vineyard. Well, so, but you can really tell the difference, and they won't generally give you as kind of as much fruit as this, but they still, you know, still give you enough to make it worth your time. We're probably Play. the only ones who use these terracotta casks. So when you want to talk about kind of Italian heritage, these are um, come from Florence. The hillsides outside of Florence, there's a commune called Impruneta. It has a clay that lends itself very well to uh, making pottery, earthen vessels. It's high in a material called galestro, which kind of helps the conductive properties of it. So it uh, very slowly acclimates to the temperature around it. So if you're storing wine in it, that's really great because it can kind of keep and maintain that moderate temperature um, for longer than other sorts of ice. It's also pretty low in metals, which makes it great for you know putting a beverage in, so it's not gonna leach that out of it. Um, as you guys were rubbing these, you, I'm sure you could kind of feel that they were a little uneven, and you can kind of see the lines where they took the tool and kind of smoothed it out. These are all made by hand. And they have to make them just, um, you know, like 10, 12 inches at a time because you have to let the, the base kind of uh, harden as you go because of their large size, they will deform as you can make them all time. So it's kind of a, a slow, laborious process because they're all on the back end. And then they're uh, dried out for a few weeks. you got to get their moisture content kind of nice and even, and then they are uh, kiln for three days at 1100 degrees, so quite a long time pulling kind of the last of that, called AOC. And so that helped consumers know if you saw an AOC label on it from a certain region, you would know, okay, it was made with scrapes, it was made in a certain mm -hmm. style. Um, so if you went to the store and you saw this wine, you kind of knew what you were getting into. So the Italians, they decided they wanted to um, replicate that. And in a very Italian fashion, it was just not quite, it didn't turn out quite as well as it did for the French. So in Tuscany, the main wine was Chianti. And for the Chianti designation, you could put up to 20% of a white wine. So you can use white grapes to fill it out. So that gave you more volume, more to sell, but it didn't really make a better wine. There were some old Italian winemaking families in Tuscany, and I'm you know, talking like 1300, they've been making wine in their family for that extended period of time. And they knew that the land in Tuscany was a lot better than just kind of you know, wicker basket Chianti that was getting sold. So they were pleading with the Italian government, hey, we know we can do better here. Give us another classification that we can make wine on. Predictably, the Italian government said no. They started making their own wine anyway. What they were doing is they were pulling in the French variety. So your 